Angela Rivellese, uh, Naples, Italy. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all the present, uh, presenters. I have uh, two questions, one uh, related to the PREDIMED study and uh, the other one uh, to ULF. For what concerns PREDIMED study, if I remember well, the Mediterranean diet with the nuts reduced uh, diabetes incidence by 18%, but this is not significant. Uh, instead, so is, uh, it appears to be less effective than the other kind of uh, diets for what concern diabetes incidence, while it's effective for what concern cardiovascular events. Have you any uh, possible explanation of these differences? In case of the, the diabetes incident, we have observed for 18% uh, reduction yeah. on the incidence of diabetes. That this was not significant. It's near to the significance, but it's not significant in the group that received NATS. Yeah. But we have demonstrated a 30% reduction in, in the incidences of it. Uh, we don't have uh, explanations of these uh, differences, but uh, all, all this reduction is in the same direction, and probably we need, uh, we don't have a uh, note uh, uh, power in order to demonstrate uh, these beneficial effects on, on nuts, mm -hmm. but uh, the, we have observed the same the same direction because okay. uh, the the composition, the the, the, the polyphenol composition of uh, nuts and, and, and uh, olive oil are very similar. There are, there are differences, but uh, uh, both the groups are very rich in polyphenols and our uh, uh, food that are rich in monounsaturated mm -hmm. fatty acids, polyunsaturated fatty acids in case of walnuts. So it's, uh, I suppose, is a change, challenge. It's only chance. And one for a uh, uh, Looking at the composition of your healthy Nordic diet, I was really impressed, the composition in terms of nutrients. Uh, by the fact that this composition was exactly the same of the composition of the diet rich in fiber that we have used for many years in our intervention study. So with the different traditional foods, we can achieve the same, but exactly the same composition of diets. And since this kind of diets in our hands are mainly effective in the post <coughs> Have you data, especially on glucose metabolism, on the postprandial data? Um, thank you for this comment. We don't have the, we have not done much postprandial studies yet. Only glucose tolerance tests, and where we did not see um, so much in, in one of these studies I showed, but that was um, was not. Um, designed to study that, but um, so no, we have not done postprandial, for instance, meal uh, tests, standardized meal tests that would be interesting. Uh, yeah, so that remains to be done. Yeah. Yes, hello, it's uh, Dr. Bernard Venn from the University of Otago in New Zealand, and I have a question for Neil Bard, please. Um, firstly, thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite remarkable to see those changes with the vegan diet, although I'm not sure that in New Zealand, which is a country that relies on its meat and dairy for its, its main economy, that it would be a welcome message if everyone went vegan. Uh, but the question I have for you is um, regarding vitamin B12. So if these people are truly vegan, then they've excluded vitamin B12 from their diets. So um, what are you advising the, these people over the long term? Uh, because it may take a number of years to see a vitamin B12 deficiency manifest itself. Great. Thank you for, for um, raising that question because it's something that I, I should have included in my presentation. Uh, vitamin B12 obviously is essential for healthy nerves and healthy blood, and, and you have to have it. But it's not an animal product, and nor is it a plant product. Uh, B12 is made by bacteria. and. Um, 
so we encourage people to, uh, uh, meat eaters will get some B12 because of the bacteria that live in a cow's gut. Um, however, it's tightly adhered to protein, and so even many meat eaters tend to run low in B12, particularly if they don't make good stomach acid. Uh, if they're not producing much stomach acid or if they're treated with metformin, many of them will, will be marginal and low, or, or even if they're up in years a little bit. So the U.S. government has actually recommended for a, some time that everyone over age 50 supplement with B12 and not rely on food sources alone. And so anyone following a vegan diet would want to, to, to do that as well. So in all of the intervention trials that, that we do, we recommend B12 uh, as a supplement. And it's, it's um, added to many foods as well. Um, it's, you'll, you'll see it added to soy milk and cereals and all kinds of things. But I encourage people not to rely on that source and just to take a supplement. And, and in fact, I encourage that for, for everybody regardless, regardless of diet. So th thank you for raising that, it's very important. Yeah. Hi, uh, Livio Luzzi, Milan, Italy. Uh, congratulations. I have a question for Dr. Barnard. Um, first simple question. Uh, one glass of wine to your vegan patient is allowed or not? Um, and then I, <laughs> it, well, wine is in the fruit group, so of course it would be allowed. Um, okay. <laughs> in, our, in our research, in, let me think, in, in I think virtually all the intervention trials that we've done, we've allowed men to have up to two drinks a day and women one. Okay. Um, and that's really, that's not a health recommendation. That's simply a question of what uh, is going to affect our outcomes. Now, were I to make a health recommendation, it would be different from that. Because when we talk to our friends who are in oncology, they, they remind us that women who drink even red wine um, have a higher increase, they have, they have an increased risk of breast cancer if it's even one glass, if it's on a daily basis. So were I to make a, a health recommendation, I would encourage people to think about the, the other health risks that accompany alcohol, but in our studies we, allow, we, did, uh, we did allow it. And then I have a, another question on the mechanism that you proposed, the, che, the chewing gum me mechanism, uh, the, the FFA uh, mechanism. <coughs> Besides that, don't you think that uh, an additional positive mechanism could be the content of plants, which is different from meat, many proteins derived uh, derive from, from plants have been shown to have uh, insulin mimetic effects, for instance, phaseolamine from beans, uh, uh, other, other uh, proteins from other legumes uh, mainly are, uh, have uh, uh, an anti-diabetic effect. Um, it, well, it's a terrific question. It's, um uh, I, I was struck by, by Hannah's uh, presentation about the fact that it's, it's not necessarily just the, the, the fat and so forth, but it's also what tends to accumulate in it that, that may exert some effects. In her case, she was describing the effect on the beta cell, which I think is, is terrifically important. But then also when we look at what, what happens with beans, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Jenkins has done some very interesting writing in, in describing the portfolio diet, that if you look at, at the effects of uh, of a number of constituents of foods. They will have, for example, a lipid lowering effect that can be independent, de depending on the type of food group we, we are speaking of. Um, so, so yes, I think there is something to that. Having said that, um, the, the big effect of a plant-based diet, perhaps, could, is, a, is a very simple one, that plants have fiber, animals don't. Um, so every single mouthful of a vegetable or a fruit or a grain or a bean gives you some fiber that reduces the calories that causes you to feel full with fewer, fewer calories. Every bite of Velveeta, I mean, you get, it, it, it's not from a plant. It doesn't have any fiber, so you get all the calories that are in it. And I got to tell you, I really think that's probably the, 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 the big thing. There are, there are many other um, uh, actors that may explain its effect as well. Uh, Osama Hamdi, uh, Harvard Medical School in uh, Boston. Uh, wonderful start. It looks like we will have a lot of intellectual uh, discussion. I just came from the ADA and we have a lot of uh, data as well. I have a very quick question for Olf and Neil. The first one for Olf. Uh, your Nordic diet, which you showed after a baseline and after eight or six or ten weeks, uh, is lower in caloric intake by around 550 and lower in saturated fat from 15% down to 5%. In reality, if you apply any diet that will have lower caloric intake by 550 and lower saturated fat from 15 to 5, you will get the same results. 
So it is Nordic diet or it is a low calorie diet. I, I was assuming that when you design a study, you will fix the caloric intake between the two groups so you can see the effect of the Nordic diet. Yes, that, that's an important point. And, and um, in that study, there was an ad libitum study, so it was not a deliberate um, um, caloric uh, reduction. That was because they felt um, satiety, and uh, that was the reason they, they lost weight. But another study I showed the long term, the six month study was um, isocaloric, so that was matched to, to, so that was another, they should not really be difficult to compare the results because, and that there the results was, was not as pronounced, but we saw result, uh, effects on, on uh, inf inflammatory gene expression on, on the blood lipids and some on the inflammation markers also without this weight loss. So, so it supports that I think uh, part, a great part of some of the effects is mediated through weight loss as, as you say, any diet have that effect, but, but also some of these are not related to weight loss. We also statistically adjusted for that and seem to the blood pressure, for instance, might be more driven through other components and salt reduction also, but um, and the blood lipids was, seem to be very independent of the weight loss. So, so I think it's, it's a good comment, but uh, we need to do more studies to, to, to control uh, different types of controls. The energy. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my second question to Neil. Uh, I like your presentation very well. And uh, in our Lancet article last year was Frank, who we mentioned among the dietary patterns a vision diet. But I would like to ask you, and I would like to know your perspective, why the prevalence of diabetes is booming up in India and China, especially in India. And Mohan presented some data, which is very interesting. Those people are mostly strict vegetarian uh, majority, actually, of them. And they still get diabetes, even in the rural areas. So the prevalence of diabetes in India now is going significantly up. Uh, is there a question mark about vegetarian diet in India, or? Um, when you travel to India and you are looking to adhere to a low-fat vegan diet, you're frustrated in two ways. The first is, um, the, adherent, the, the, the use of phenomenal amounts of dairy products in the diet. And the second is uh, heroic amounts of oil uh, consumed. And when I give talks to, at Indian medical centers, the number one question is not what I get in Fargo, which is about where do you get your protein, um, which is what everyone asks me in the US, but it's how can you live without milk? And we always have a reception in advance of the lecture in which we're served what is called tea, but is three quarters milk. It's a little bit like the ice cap that I was hearing about. I don't think that's coffee. I think that's milk with some coffee added in it. Um, I could be wrong, but, if it, but uh, you see a lot of these drinks. And there's huge amounts of, of dairy, typically full-fat dairy. And if it's non-fat dairy, what's the main nutrient? It's sugar. Uh, it's lactose sugar instead of fructose uh, or sucrose or something like that, but it's still a sugary beverage. So the, I think the issue in, in India is a huge amount of dairy and oil in traditional, quote unquote, traditional diets. But of course, there's been massive um, westernization in India as elsewhere. And when you, when you look in any city in India now, you're, you're, you're quite impressed by Pizza Hut and other western chains now um, in the airports and on the street and, and uh, a vegetarian diet being respected as the quaint uh, practice of our forebears that we now conveniently ignore. Um, you're suggesting that dairy would be beneficial for, for individuals, have you? Um, that I'm not prepared to, to defend. I'm going to suggest that dairy products are a very high source of fat, particularly saturated fat, and that it's going to add to the, the problems that we're seeing here. Jim Painter, uh, U.S. Uh, two questions for all. One question is the Nordic diet, the healthy Nordic diet, which seemed like a Mediterranean diet, had all these fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and legumes. How much of the Nordic people actually eat that way? And the second question is, you talk about rapeseed oil. Well, in Canada, we talk about canola oil specifically because they want to make sure they don't say rapeseed oil because of the uric acid. Did you take it out of it, or is it still in there? Thanks. Uh, I'll start with the, the rapeseed oil. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not there. So it's basically the same as canola oil. It's very similar. So 
uh, it's not no urea acid uh, in the, the rapeseed oils. And um, then uh, about how many uh, Nordic people that adhere to this healthy Nordic diet, I think it's 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 not so it's a minority as in all, all populations there are uh, um, too few that are adhering to the nutritional recommendation, the national nutri nutrition recommendations, and maybe Ursula have a good answer on that. How many? Well, I think it's like less than uh, thirty percent. I would guess is 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 uh, adhering to this healthy Nordic diet in the Nordic countries, uh, and I agree it's, it's close to the similar to the local, to the Mediterranean diet, which just use. It's a similar diet in, in many aspects, but they, they just use maybe olive oil instead of rapeseed oil and have some other types of legumes, but it's basically quite similar. David? David Jenkins, Toronto. I declare my conflict of interest with portfolio diets and, and glycemic index. But So I, I really enjoyed the presentations. Um, uh, one thing really for, for all I had he showed very interesting that without weight loss, you managed to get a reduction in abdominal fat and uh, inflammatory biomarkers. Do you, is that, that common across all the diets, especially when you've got weight loss, do you get even more um, abdominal fat uh, reduction and better CRP, or is it just something that's long-term, that you see in the long-term? Do, do you need a long-term? Can your more acute studies where you've shown you actually get weight loss, do you actually repeat the same things as you get in the longer term without weight loss? Um, that was um, seen in, in uh, three months and, and uh, um, the, the abdominal fat was reduction was not seen in the, in the isocaloric, uh, strict isocaloric style, but we, we was measured with waist circumference and was not a significant uh, reduction, but that was um, no rate so so um, um, I think we need to do more studies and show in, in looking at long term versus regarding abdominal fat and the inflammation. But but it, I think that's a very interesting finding that we see this reduction uh, without weight loss, which is uh, at least in two studies. So, so yeah. Final question. Yeah, I'm Fred Browns, Maastricht University, Netherlands. I have a question to Jordi and a link to Neil also. So two two points. Uh, Jordi, the, uh, the choice of the control is always essential to show uh, effects of the experimental uh, lag. And in, in your studies, you have the Mediterranean diet, but the control is a diet in which you cut out the, the, the lipids as much as possible. And I would say that is a control diet which is on the unhealthy side. Now, you see benefits of the uh, Mediterranean diet versus control. And what I would like to know is how much of this benefit is explained by the unhealthy effects of the control. So what are changes versus baseline? That there may be a difference. <laughs> so I would like to, to hear your comment on that. Yes, uh, this is impossible to, to answer. It's very difficult to answer what, because uh, we, 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 we compare two, two different uh, interventions. No? Uh, what we have uh, changed in the Predimet study is the overall food pattern. And I think this is one of the important things in order to explain the results. Because, for example, we have used uh, the 40-point score uh, in order to measure this adherence to the Mediterranean diet. At the end of the follow-up, during the follow-up and at the end of the follow-up, we have observed little changes in the uh, total food pattern. But we have observed a significant differences in 11 of these 40 points. So I think that at the end, that we have observed is the result of changing the overall food pattern. It's slow, it's small changes, but a small ch changes that, uh, uh, that at the end we, uh, are changes, important changes in order to explain this reduction in, on, on uh, incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease or on incidence of diabetes. I, and I, it, it is impossible to, to say what is the part 
of the healthy diet that we promote, the changes that we have promoted in the in the in the in the both uh, Mediterranean diet groups in comparison to the control group, because in the control group we have also observed so beneficial changes in diet. Yeah, yeah, but you, you you have a baseline where you start. So if you compare versus baseline, you will see the effects of both. And then it may be that it's not significant, whereas versus control, there is a significance. Now, there's one thing that triggers me. In in the Mediterranean diet, you say, include fish, include oils, etc. Uh, Neil says, exclude the fish, exclude the oils, that's beneficial. If I would be a consumer, I would get lost here. Now, now what should we do? And, and I would like to hear your comment on that. Go ahead, Efti. Is that? Please. Yes. Um, that, it depends. Uh, the la during the last years, uh, scientific, uh, uh, researchers have been focused on fat. Fat is bad. And I think that it depends on the type of, of fat. It's the same that yesterday we were discussing about the amount of carbohydrate. I think is now we have proofs that the type of fat and the type of carbohydrates are more important than the amount at the end. So I think in case of the Mediterranean diet, fat is a healthy fat. It's fat from vegetable origin that is completely different as saturated fatty acid. And in case of carbo carbohydrates, it's the same. The, the, the Mediterranean diet had a low glycemic index and low glycemic load. So uh, I, I think that fat is not bad. It depends on the type of fat. And in, in case of Mediterranean countries, we, we consume approximately 35% of the energy or more as fat, but it's vegetable fat in form especially of virgin olive oil that is very rich in polyphenols, in several bio, bio, uh, phytochemicals, and it's the, it's the same case of nuts. Nuts are very rich in monosaturated fatty acids, in polysaturated <coughs> fatty acids, and in polyphenols and antioxidants. Uh, and it's for this that this type of fat probably is better, better, is better oxidized also, uh, has uh, several benefits that can explain that in the Mediterranean countries we can uh, uh, consume more amounts of fat. Need a very short comment, please. Um, very short answer. Yes, um, I, I, I certainly agree that different fats have different properties, um, and, and that's that's quite dramatically so. Um, what unites them all is that they all have nine calories per gram, uh, compared with carbohydrate, which has only four, and that's something that's often forgotten. And when you have a patient who's got diabetes and they're trying to lose weight and you want to limit the most calorie-dense foods, if you're starting with sugar, well, that may be number two. Um, number one is the lipid content of the diet. And where you really see this coming in is with a, a salmon enthusiast who forgets that Chinook salmon is 50% fat and Atlantic salmon is 40% fat. It's, it's a sponge filled with grease, basically. And they're wondering, why am I having trouble losing fat? I'm only eating good fats. And it's true, their thighs are filled with good fat. And so what we and their, their cells maybe as well. So um, what, where we arrived at this is by following the epidemiology, finding that the fish eaters do do better than the beef eaters, but not nearly as well as the people following uh, a, a vegan diet. So that's, that's guided our, our work. Thank you. So I thank all the speakers, the discussant, and also on behalf of Ursula, I thank all of you for participating in this very intense session.